It's October 5th, 2019 at the 6th Autumn Raid Tassai. The people were enjoying the event with cosplayers, fan art, and lots of games. However, little did people know that there was something monumental to be announced by the creator of Toho, Zun, and a team he commonly worked with for his games, Twilight Frontier. The people walked up to their booth to see what this strange and mysterious new game was. And upon getting the trial CD cases, they discovered that this Toho game was going to be like no other. Toho Goyoku Ibun is a game that sparked the curiosity in the minds of Toho fans due to a new radically different game style. All the official mainline Toho games that came before were bullet hell, but in the land of the side games, things vary from photography to fighting. Goyoku Ibun was not something ever before seen in Toho, being a platformer fighter mix game using a strange new water sucking mechanic. As expected, the internet east and west went wild. The best part about Toho as a whole is the release schedule for the games as, when the first trial releases, it only takes, at most, only a few months until the full completed game comes out to the world. Many expected Goyoku Iban to be no different, and since it was October 2019, many foresaw a New Year's release at the Winter Comic Hat. Winter came and went. Nothing. However, that can be forgivable as the trial of the game was undercooked, with even the dialogue being represented by only periods. And of course, the virus didn't help things. We have to travel a full year to October 2020 to see a second, more cooked trial with a playable Marisa Kurosame in actual text. Whoa! More importantly, the two developers at Twilight Frontier made a promise to release the game in March 2021 at Rei 18. It was a no-brainer too since the second trial was practically near completion the most. Fast forward to March, and... A second delay. On Twitter, the team made a series of tweets apologizing for the mess since they underestimated the scope of the game. They had to delay it again, this time to the next Autumn Ray to sign October. Fans were a little annoyed at this point, but understood and were still excited for what the full release would entail. Zun himself even stated that the story would be the most destructive yet nostalgic ever seen in Toho Project. Fast forward again to October 24th, 2021. Judgment Day. At Autumn Raid to Site 7, the game finally released, two years after first demonstration. To say the least, the internet was excited. The funny thing was, the development took so long that Toho 18 came out, while Goyoku Iban was numbered 17.5. It's an out of continuity and strange fact that would be oddly prophetic on the legacy of Goyoku Iban. Upon release, many would point out the big elephant in the room. The best part. The story. Here's a challenge for you. Go search up the Goyoku Iban OST and click on a random video. Some point in your journey, you will find at least one comment talking about the insane story, something not common among the other Toho games, and it's easy to see why. It follows the tale of our friends having a nice sunny day until a mysterious black liquid gushes from the ground. It wasn't your ordinary water, it was sticky, repugnant, and hard to get off. Many saw it as a curse, others a business opportunity. No matter what the plans were, one thing is certain. We gotta get to the bottom of this. In order to solve this incident, you gotta play through the game with the various characters, starting with Reimu. She travels across the world, from a forest, a glowing bath city, and eventually narrows down the location of such oil to the underworld, where she encounters the big, bad, evil character of the day, Yuma Toltets. She knows the power and wealth that oil provides, so upon hearing that it is erupted on the surface and the threat of some dingus idiot stealing it, Yuma was not going to share her oil with anyone. It has nutrients in it, apparently. She lost. It's now Maurice's turn to have a go, following a similar route, but... She also lost. Kaneko had her turn seeing on what's going on, as her nuclear reactor was covered in the stuff. She encountered Yuma and had a chance to beat her, and she lost. Marasa, a phantom of the Muran Temple, saw that the oil was invading her area too. So she set up to kill Yuma, and she lost too. 
Joel and Shion heard from Kanako about the oil in their quest, so they set out to collect it for themselves on some get-rich-quick scheme. On their journey, they tried to kill Kanako, but then, a ripple in the matrix occurred. A door appeared out of nowhere to suck them into... the Scarlet Devil Mansion, where they encountered Flandra. Oh, it's her! After playing a bit with her, another door appears out of nowhere so they can encounter Yuma once again. This time, it'll be... Nope, still lost. Okay, this is getting annoying at this point. Okina saw that such a powerful being could not be stopped by the most powerful squad ever assembled. So, she called in the last resort. Flandra. You see, her power is to destroy anything and everything she touches. Flandra saw that this was a great opportunity to get some exercise and touch some grass, or something. Okina knew that vampires had a weakness to water, so she prepared some training exercises to help her overcome her faults. She's ready. Flandra is sent to hell to fight Yuma in the final showdown. She saved the world, right? Not again. Okay, now she's dead. Oh no, she's giant! However, Flandra had an idea. Since she can suck up bullets via her Levitine, she can probably collect enough water to create something big to choke her out. I mean, Yuma was pretty hungry after all. But when everything is at stake here, one wrong move in the entire world is toast. <laughs> Flandra saves the world at last. Ah, uh, this is a bloody joke now. <laughs> However, Yuma was different this time. She and Okina decide to make a deal regarding the oil. Essentially, Yuma will have to learn to share her oil with the outside world. Flandra was a bit sad that she didn't flat out kill Yuma, but Okina reassured her that she did so much more. She made the evil less evil and prove to the world that she can do anything with a little bit of help from a lady on a wheelchair. Yeah, it's a lot. The story is essentially, a character goes on a quest, dies to Yuma. Another one starts an adventure, dies to Yuma. Another one wants to have fun, dies to Yuma. It really starts to heat up when it comes to Flandre's appearance. It was her first major time in the spotlight in almost 20 years at that point, so the fandom seeing her fight at last was exciting, but playing and experiencing her treasures was just... Whoa. Her fight with Yuma was essentially testing the concept of the unstoppable force versus the immovable object, as she was really the only character that could probably stop her. Also, her mansion stage is just really cool, like I love the aesthetics and songs so much. It's easy to see how Flandra steals the show, which is what I would say if it weren't for Yuma. Ignore your parents, drink shell oil. Yeah, that kind of sums up her entire personality. She's clever, calculated, yet extremely greedy. Literally, she tries to kill everyone that comes to steal her oil. Her sheer power was something to be awed at, since not even Reimu and Marisa, characters that have traditionally stopped other major threats in the past, lost to her. The only reason she backed down was because she couldn't talk sense into Flandre's childish brain and relentless power. Their climactic battle was... painful, but also exciting to watch play out, so it's easy to see how those two are now associated with the game. But, but, but hey now, there are like other final bosses in Toho that are super cool like Yuma too, uh, right dude? You might be right there, but have you considered the memes? I have an army! Will I have flam? Kicho, not understanding how she's losing to me. Me, who's been eating her pieces when she's not looking. <laughs> Drink shell oil. 
It's only a spoonful. In the realm of Toho, the most popular characters are associated with popular songs, crazy ass moments, and memes. Cerno has Fumos, Flandra has Yu and Owen, Hina has. whatever that is. Yuma is probably the most memed upon character in recent memory, due in large part to two memes. Her spoon is the obvious first choice, because, really, what kind of supervillain would carry such a thing? Have a spoon. They caught him in the The second would be her greed for oil. Drink shell oil! Again, it's a big part of her character. If you create funny and memorable memes of a character, interest in them will spread quickly. In a 2022 Toho popularity poll, she debuted in 53rd place. Not too shabby for a first timer, but what made it remarkable is how in 2023, she made a huge jump all the way to 29th, up in ranks of already established characters like Utsuho and Junko, due largely in part to her memes and monumental appearance in Toho 19, where she was made playable again. But we already talked about that mess of a game. However, Yuma did fare pretty well there, so how does she and the rest of the cast do in Goyoko Ibun? It's wild, wacky, and weird. <laughs> Toho is known for being a Donmaku series, so trying to find mechanics that retain dodging bullets while fitting it into a platformer format is, um, a challenge to say the least. There have been six other Toho games that have attempted to solve this issue to a good success, but they were competitive fighters. Goyoku Iban has more platformer S mechanics, which means, yes, I'm going to compare this to Smash Bros. again. The two are actually quite similar when you think about it. Movement, platforming, special attacks, but where they differ is how they combat water. In Smash Bros, you can swim, but you have a limit before you drown. In Melee, it's instant. In Goyoku Iban, however, water is essential to charge a special meter where you can spit out a super attack. Every character tackles this differently though, which reminds me, now is a good time to talk about how each character plays as they are really distinct compared to each other. But in the beginning, everyone learns how to play with Reimu. She's the basic all-rounder, easy to control, easy to combo, yet has a weak range that can be annoying to overcome. Charge up her water meter and she shoots out orbs. She's most comparable to Mario, literally the most vanilla, plain yet utilitarian character. She just works. Hey, some people prefer it like that, and that's okay. But if you're looking for something spicier, then Marisa has you covered. She has fewer melee attacks, but to compensate, she can shoot at a distance with her magic. Stars, bottles, and even a dash attack that reminds me of Fox's shine from melee. Her special attack is cool too, just her vomiting all the water. Though, don't get too greedy as... Yeah... But as long as you play with her range in mind, she's fun. Marisa is all about her speed. But what if you like flying? Oh no, it's Kanako. She has no melee attacks, so her only method of dealing damage is via her own Bashira in wind. She's more defensive than the previous two, as her own Bashira can be shot at a distance to hurt enemies. But her down B plus A combo allows them to be aimed wherever you want, which is sweet. Her special attack is her using her own Bashira to become a gun. Also, she can fly. Like, how is that not cool? She is kind of brainless to be honest. Just corner the enemy and spam down B. So if you want to be an epic skilled gamer, then Marasa is for you. She has the most movement options in the game. First and foremost, she can web sling with her anchors. Yeah, just seeing Marasa fly where I want her to go gives me so much life. Her anchors allow for a long range yet aggressive playstyle that probably would attract many. It also helps with the double B combo. Essentially, use your special attack while pressing B quickly to double up on your enemy while also using a bit of water. It's a good use that's criminally underrated. If you choose to charge up a special attack though, she shoots ghost anchors. Ooh. I think her web slinging is cooler though. When you rush on an enemy just right, it's the best feeling in the world but she does have a bit of a learning curve. I'm certain it's the same case with another technical character. Jon and Shion. Yeah, two characters this time. 
Jolin is the attacker, while Xion is the body shield. Xion can be thrown by Jolin so she can rush up and use her melee attacks to deal damage. However, Xion is the one sucking up water, and when at 100%, she goes sickle mode. Though for a moment she does become incapacitated. In my eyes, Jolin and Xion are kind of bad. In Sonic 2, Tails is quite infamous for holding Sonic back in the bonus ring stages, and I think Xion has the same problem. Jolin is really solid on her own actually, just having to manage a flying dingus while also dealing with fast paced bosses is just, it's not great, I'm sorry. So why don't we go back to the actual fun characters? Flandra. Think of Reimu, but supercharged. Her melee attacks are far reaching and damage well, though her air attack is kind of goofy. She's relatively fast and can transform into a bat to fly. She's great. Though at one major expense. You know water? <laughs> yeah, no. Flanger collects water automatically, which sounds nice until you learn that it slows you down the higher the meter is, up until 100% where you will take periodic damage. To combat this, you must use your charge to clear out your meter in the water around you, which has an upside of dealing damage, but immobilizes you for a moment. Which means if you're stupid like me, pressing the button always means a guaranteed hit. It's a clunky feature that keeps Flandra in check. When she's crippled, she is crippled. But when you get her rolling, she is rolling. She's the last character you unlock in the traditional story mode, which is a nice reward for dealing with trash. However, about one year after Goyo Koiban released, a port to Nintendo Switch was announced that revealed three important things. The first was the English translation that included a new official title, Sunken Fossil World. I still call it Goyo Koiban because it's cooler. It's like the whole Dunkin' Donuts vs. Dunkin' thing. It's still Dunkin' Donuts in my heart. The second is a new mysterious challenge mode that I will talk about in a moment, because the third was a new playable character. Yuma Toltets. Yeah, the Spoon Lady makes her first playable appearance in her own game. Bro, it's out of this world. Of course, her gameplay revolves around her spoon, where she has a few melee attacks you can do with it, though with the major downside that she is slow as molasses on the ground, which effectively forces you to jump for movement. You can make platforms in the air and make her long jump far, but to make up for her faults, she has one funny thing she can do. Yuma is Kirby, even down to the animation. It doesn't really make her experience any better, sucking up water immobilizes you, but have you seen a goat become a freaking dragon? Nope. I rest my case then. Um, still though, Flandra is better. When you beat the game with all the characters routes and updated versions, you unlock that mysterious challenge mode from earlier. Something called the Greedy Challenge. If you're in the mood to kill, get freaking ready. It's a boss rush where you traverse 20 bosses in a row. Oh, but what if I lose all my lives on round 14? Well, I'm sorry there, Timmy. Game over. Now, the bosses are not the easiest in the world, so why would you want to play a harder version of story mode? It gets a lot better of items. After beating a boss, Okina gives you three items to select from, like an orb that helps you deal damage or an anchor that smashes when you earn a combo. It makes the experience better the farther you go, but it still relies on you not getting hit, so it's not for the faint of heart. I have tried it a few times, but I couldn't get far enough. I guess I'm not an epic gamer. Which reminds me... The bad. This game will test your patience. Seriously, it was frustrating to learn. You see, games will have a learning curve that looks something like this. You see, simple and smooth. Goku even has something like this. When I was explaining the characters, that was just the tip of the iceberg, as you also have to consider the water levels, the bullet patterns of the bosses, the platforming, where to go. Oh, but you also must have situational awareness of when to suck up water. But then again, Shion and Jon have a thing with blood with Yuma's fight that is exclusive to them. Also, you need to see if a boss has a red magic circle to cripple them. But sadly, to get to the bosses, you need to be careful because you cannot pass through some bullets, Kutaka. It's a lot. It's a technical game that is a bit easy to pick up, but to get to a normal level of play, you have to dedicate yourself. In Smash Bros, it's simple to understand the basic principles. 
you hit, you move, you shield, and if you're cool, you smash ball. The niche character specific tech comes after for the most part. In Goyuki Ibun, you hit, you move depending on what character you play, you dash to avoid attacks which take up precious stamina, and if you're cool, find the ultra perfect time to suck up water before you inevitably get hit. The niche character specific tech comes right when you play the tutorial. What I'm saying is, it's not an easy game to get into. If you're not dedicated to the game, you will suffer on easy mode. Wait, wait, wait. Easy mode? Yeah, the Switch version has an exclusive easy mode that I used throughout my playthrough of the game. Yeah, I know, call me a loser, I don't care. It was enough of a struggle. Losing my life so many times on Yuma and Okina's final was a giant yikes. Let's just say I maybe kinda sorta got angry more than once. It got a little better the farther I played, but that's probably because I discovered a new game-breaking strategy. Button mashing. You mash buttons on your controller when the boss is near, and you win. No tears for me, Kotaka. But you know, there are a few people in the world that saw beyond the gloom and doom of Goyoko Ibon to discover a treasure trove of potential via the speedrun. There is a speedrunning community for the game that, while small, is also mighty. Go to speedrun.com and look up a random world record for the game, and you will see people perform runs with elegance and grace that only 99% could dream of. Shredding Oku in seconds, precise button presses, and taking advantage of character specific tech. It's finding the beauty in the mess. The music is as good as ever. The character cast, while strange, is also a standout feature. And I'll just say it, the art style is the most iconic in the entire franchise that, when replicated, can produce some impressive results. Of course, this game may be my nemesis, but the more I think about it, I mean, I can't be angry at this game forever. It just has a few bad parts. It's like the vegetables on a Thanksgiving dinner. You have to think about the turkey and pumpkin pie. The developers had a rough time making the game, going through delay after delay because of... The virus. Overambition and a lack of help, since there were only two guys making it. At the end of their journey though, you can maybe make the argument they succeeded in putting together a fun game, but with absolute certainty in my opinion, they created a game like no other that will stand out in the vast sea of the Toho Library. Hi, thank you for making it to the end of this video. I really do appreciate it. Now remember kids, before I go... Ignore your parents, drink shell oil.